Okay, let's delve into the work. Whose side are you on? Or on whose side, if you want to be grammatically correct. So before we get to this scripture, let me give you a little bit of backdrop. We should all be saying, I'm on the Lord's side, amen. amen. If we go back to that question, whose side are you on? We should all be saying, I'm on the Lord's side. But before we can definitively say that, I want us to examine six things that Christians need to stop doing. Six things. The first thing is stop saying, God knows my heart. Oftentimes we say that when there is some evil in us that we don't want to submit just yet. We often hear people say, God knows my heart when they don't want to be held accountable about something. And years ago, when I was in my 20s, one of my former church members was married to a man. She was female. You got to say that nowadays. She was female, married to a man. And she was separated from him at the time. And she began dating another man before her divorce was finalized. Now, she felt justified in going to the movies, going to dinner, because in her mind, if she wasn't sleeping with him, she was fine. But we have to know that when people say, God knows my heart, it's an excuse. It's a way for us to justify our behaviors. And let's look at that in scripture. The Apostle Paul, he tells us not to have anything to do with the appearance of evil. And that is in 1 Thessalonians 5, 22 and 23. And this is the New Living Translation. Stay away from every kind of evil. Now may the God of peace make you holy in every way. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless unto our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. Amen. So again, I pose the question, whose side are you on? Are you on the side of righteousness or are you on the side of evil? Because people will begin to notice. The second thing, number two. The second thing as Christians we need to stop doing is saying, I'm going to pray for you and forget. Take the time at that very moment and pray for the person because the busyness of our day is going to get the best of us oftentimes. Sometimes we'll forget their name. Sometimes we'll forget their situation. Sometimes we'll just forget their, whatever their issue was. And we'll just forget sometimes in general. And I remember being at a <laughs> restaurant. It was a classmate. Uh, he was a year behind me. He had opened up a restaurant. And the whole city was excited. It was a small town. Well, no, not this small. It was about 50,000 people. <laughs> so I can't say small town anymore. About 50,000 people. But we were all excited because we knew him. And we went to the restaurant. Larry was there. He didn't know the guy, but, you know, he was there. And Larry said, uh, I'd like to pray for you. And I'm looking at Larry like, we got people in the line behind us. You ain't even paid for the food yet. Like, I'm in my mind, I'm saying this because I'm being a dutiful wife and not, you know, saying anything. But I'm thinking, like, what is this man doing? But at that moment, he stopped and did exactly what he said he was going to do, which is, I'm going, I want to pray for you. Amen? And that's what we need to do. We need to take to the time at that moment to do just that. Because although our intentions are good, like I said, the busyness of our day will catch up with us. So our next scripture deals, stands 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 and 18. Never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belongs to Christ Jesus. So the scripture is telling us basically to pray without ceasing. We should have a prayer on our lips at all times. Amen? Because I'm a firm believer that we would be in much better shape navigating this evil world if we were praying the way that we claim that we are praying. And I remember another instance where my classmate, he was getting, this is high school, he was getting his leg amputated. And his wife, who was also a classmate, called me and wanted me to pray. 
And I'm thinking, when you start getting body parts removed, this is serious business, you know. So I posted on my Facebook page to pray for our classmate. Sure enough, I had someone inbox me and say, what am I praying about? And I said, just pray. She inboxed me again, and she says, but my prayer would be so much more effective if you would tell me what I'm praying about. And I said, God knows, just pray. So she inboxed me again, and I'm like, okay, now this girl getting on my nerves now because this is just plum ridiculous. Like, you're not even following orders. Just pray. You know what I'm saying? You're trying to be nosy. So I said, if you were in this situation, wouldn't you want your privacy protected? I'm not at liberty to share with you who the classmate is and what we're praying about, but God knows. So she was getting on my nerves so much. I didn't say it, but I started thinking, is her prayer going to reach higher than the ceiling? Because she doing all this talking about the situation versus the actual prayer itself. And I almost want to tell her, girl, keep your prayer. Keep it. Just keep it. Because you focus on the wrong thing. But, of course, I held my tongue and, and, and I didn't say it. Okay. Third thing we need to stop doing. Stop misquoting scriptures. Stop misquoting scriptures. Because if we're the Bible that... The only Bible that people will read, we got to make sure we get his word right when we're sharing with each other and when we're sharing with the world. And here are three ways in which we misquote scripture. Money is the root of all evil. It's the love. Absolutely. So it's not money because money is simply a tool. That's all it is. If I had $20 right here. It'll sit here until I do something with it. Either I'm going to move it, wave it, pass it on, ask God to multiply it. It can't do anything until we do something with it. And God knew that we had the potential for money to be our downfall because that's why he said, for the love of money is the root of all evil. So let's go to our next scripture, which is Matthew 6, 24 through 26, and this is the Amplified. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And mammon is defined as money, could be possession, your status, fame, anything that we value more than God. So you have people who have, and I haven't been in nobody's house, so I'm not talking to anybody here. If I come down your street, just keep looking straight because I'm not talking to you specifically, okay? You have people that got 50-inch screen TVs. Now they're up to what, 72, 96? I lost track after 35. I actually bought Larry a 32-inch. He took it back to the store. I was so offended. I said, really? It wasn't big enough for him. (laughs) He took it back. I said, that's the last TV I ever buy for you again. But anything that we value more than God. So if we're watching that big screen TV more than we're in our word, that's a violation. That's considered mammon. And we have to be able to do those those self-checks. Amen? And I'm not to say that uh, we, we have to use the money to survive in this world. But the job is to make sure we're being responsible with it. Amen? Amen. Another one that we misquote, cleanliness is next to godliness. It's not even in the Bible. It's not even in there. So not only is it misquoted, but it's given some, a place in the scripture that's not even there. And parents typically say this when they wanted their kids to clean their rooms. <laughs> cleanliness is next to godliness. Now, if you look at our scripture, still in Matthew, uh, yes, but it's 23. It should be Matthew 23, 25 to 29. Matthew 23, 25 to 29. Okay, there we go. This is Jesus talking to the Pharisees. 
and he's telling them that they need to clean themselves from the inside out. Okay? Because what good is it if we have clean hands, but our heart is evil? Amen? So let's look at that. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee. First clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside also will be clean. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. And in the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Woe to you. Now, this is not a good woe. Like sometimes you hear people say, whoa, this is not a good woe. This is not a woe that you want God or Jesus to be saying to you. Amen. So we got to make sure. And, and Jesus was very um, good about using parables. So he gave us a metaphor co uh, comparing us to a cup, comparing us to a tomb, so we could have a better understanding of his word and, and what he meant. And then here's a, the last one connected to misquoting something. To thine own self be true. To thine own self be true. Who's heard of that or who said it? You've heard it? It's William Shakespeare. It's not even Jesus. We're quoting William Shakespeare as if he's God. And I remember a missionary, this was just three and a half years ago, a missionary said that to me on something, again, something that I posted. And I'm thinking, if she knows my calling, it would have been better for her to give me a word than to quote William Shakespeare. And what she was getting at was for me to be true to him, not to be true to me. Think about that. If you're telling someone to thine own self be true, you're telling them to be true to who they are. But if evil or wickedness is in us, we don't need to be true to that. We need to be true to the God that is in us. Let's look at that in scripture as well. 2 Corinthians 13, 5 through 10. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. And I trust that you will discover that we have not failed the test. Now we pray to God that you will not do anything wrong. Not so that people will see that we have stood the test, but so that you will do what is right, even though we may seem to have failed. For we cannot do anything against the truth but only for the truth. We are glad whenever we are speaking, but you are strong. And our prayer is that you may be fully restored. This is why I write these things when I am absent, that when I come, I may not have to be harsh in my use of authority, the authority the Lord gave me for building you up, not for tearing you down. So again, we have to make sure that when we are examining ourselves, that we're examining ourselves against the word of God, not against who we want to be as individuals. Because as good as we are, there's none like him. And we have to make sure that our life is seen blameless unto him, okay? So the next one, the fourth thing that we need to stop saying, let me play devil's advocate. Now, we say that often in at work, business meetings, whenever we want to pose the opposite side of an issue. But I'm here to tell you, I'm not playing with the devil. I'm binding him at every given turn. Amen? And then when we look at the word advocate, advocate means someone who supports or recommends. So if you're playing the devil's advocate, that means you're either supporting him or recommending something about him. I don't want to have any part of either one. 
Amen. So even at work, I want people to know whose side I'm on. Now, I'm not in meetings at work hitting folk upside the head with a Bible, although some may need a little rub. <laughs> I'm not doing that. Amen. But interestingly enough, when I arrived, because on my resume, I have my community work, which has some Christian activities that, that I do. My department chair introduced me as a certified chaplain. I didn't know he was going to do that. And, and I wasn't ashamed that he did it. But it was interesting that when he did do it, all the gossipers stayed away from me. And I felt blessed. He didn't even know he was blessing me by doing that. But when it comes to rumors and gossip and things like that, I'm like the last to know because I'm not in in the water cooler talk or people pulled off to the side saying, you know, this or that. So when we're talking, we need to make sure, if we're looking at Colossians 4 and 6, this is the English Standard Version, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. And that season with salt is sprinkling the truth, sprinkling God's word in our conversations. Amen? And then the fifth thing that we need to stop saying as Christians, don't judge me. Only God can judge me. Again, and it's a true statement, only God can judge us. However, oftentimes people say it when they don't want to be held accountable about something. They want to continue in whatever sinful behavior that they're in at the moment. And we'll keep saying, don't judge me. So I started telling people I'm not. But his word is. And I'm a messenger of his word. Do with it what you will. I've done my part. I've shared the word. Now what you do with it is on you. Amen. Amen. And then here's the last thing. And this is going to be a tough one. This is for anybody that's overly political. As Christians, we have to stop buying into political propaganda because some of us are being used as pawns and we can't even see it yet. We're making donations to this political party, that political party, and both parties are flawed. Let's just be honest. Both parties are flawed. And I can say that because I've been a part of both parties and neither one of them served me well. Both parties are flawed, okay? So here's a specific example when I say political propaganda. We cannot embrace stop Asian hate, but then turn our back on Black Lives Matter. I'll say that again. We can't say stop Asian hate, but then when Black Lives Matter come, people turning their backs on that slogan because both ethnicities are important in God's eyes. So we can't get caught up in this political machine that tries to divide and separate us because that's exactly what it does, acting as if one race is more important than the other. Because people who said, stop Asian hate, that phrase was more accepted because let's be honest, Asians are a little bit more docile in their demeanor they're seen as the smartest minority group, so we have to help them. Blacks, however, are seen as a threat. Even when hateful crimes are used against us, instead of us being seen as the victim, we're seen as, well, what did they do to cause that? Or what did they do to deserve that? Because what was the alternative to Black Lives Matter? What were people saying? All lives matter. But no one was saying stop all hate when, 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 when they said stop Asian hate. Nobody countered that with stop all hate. But they countered black lives matter with all lives matter. So I want to be seen as a Christian before I'm seen as anything else. 
before I'm seen as black, before I'm seen as a woman, before I'm seen as a wife, a college instructor, an advisor, whatever role I'm playing at the time, I want to be seen as a child of God. Because the Bible tells us to hate evil and do good. It doesn't tell us to do evil towards one another. And we can see that in scripture as well. Romans 12, 9 through 16. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Remember, I talked about that separation. So again, I don't want to identify with anything that's not godly. Amen. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor. Serving the Lord, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. So some of our political views are not aligned with God's word. Because on one hand, we accept a political party that has a certain stance on certain issues, but we also accept that same political party that negatively impact the poor. And we don't question it because it's a certain political party. And in Proverbs 19 and 17 in the Amplified Version, he who is gracious and lends a hand to the poor lends to the Lord and the Lord will repay him for his good deed. And then on the other side, we accept another political party that's doing any and everything just to say, I'm not in the position to judge them. But if we look at Matthew 7 and 14, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. So we can't have anything goals as policies that we follow behind. He's telling us specifically here that narrow is the way and the gate is going to, we need to be, basically be on the straight and narrow, walking that, that straight path. Amen? Amen? So as I said before, it's good and bad in both political parties. And I'll tell you this, if you don't like what's happening now, just wait. You got four years. It could change in the next four years. That's our cycle. I've had presidents I didn't vote for, but I still honored the office because it was the highest office of the land. You may have someone in office that you don't necessarily support or vote for, but I still ask us to be respectful of the highest office of the land. And we get a chance to vote every two years for our state elections because they come around more often. So here's my position, and you, can, you might not be ready for it, and that's okay. Take it up with God, because I'm about to head out. Or you can call me, we can talk about it. We, we can talk about it, I'm not running. I, I don't want to feel as if I'm running. I want us to begin looking at politicians and their positions and not just voting for a certain political party. Now, I know it's going to take more time. It's going to take more work on our part, but it's necessary because no one should be given a pass to behave wrongly because he or she is in a certain political party. And I want us to accept that anything humans touch is going to be flawed because we're flawed. So we can't expect perfect politicians if they're flawed inherently. Just think about that. They're not going to be perfect, but we serve a perfect God. So we have to make sure that when we go into those voting booths that we're taking the Holy Spirit with us. We're discerning what we're voting for. 
Because I can tell you this, and this is off, well, I can't say off record because she recorded me, but this is not a part of my sermon, but it makes sense to share. The whole thing with the abortion, and I know I'm clear on the word of what it says about, and I thank you, evangelist, for sharing me revisiting that scripture about the innocent shedding of blood. I thank you for that. Here's the reason why that did not pass. Women are tired. Women are tired. One, we can't get pregnant by ourselves. Two, there was no focus on the man. None at all. So when the man, they even have things where Viagra, they can get that, you know, without a tax and all that. But now they want to tax uh, menstrual items for us. Women are tired. So that's the reason why it didn't pass, because it's, it's not anything being fair. The church is not um, preaching 30, 40, 50-year-olds need to remain abstinent. We're not preaching that anymore. We're telling our teenagers, our preteens, to remain abstinent. But the abortion won't be an issue if we all did what we're supposed to do, mean not be with somebody if you're not married. Because it's not people, married people are not getting abortions. Not to say that blanket statement, but you see what I'm saying. It's mainly the ones that are unmarried. But the focus was too much on the woman. And it wasn't even as far as the man being involved. Because... Here's the other thing. When God comes back to us, he's not coming back saying, which political party are you a part of? He's, he's not going to say, line up over here. If you this party, line up over there. If you with that party. He's looking at our heart. That's what he's coming back for, to look at what's going on in here. So as I close, I had a couple more examples, but as I close, I'm going to ask the question again, on whose side are you? Hopefully, we can definitively say we are on the Lord's side. Can people see our godly behavior? Do we pray for folk like we should or like we're saying that we are? Are we quoting scripture correctly? Are we playing with the devil or are we binding him? Are we doing away with behaviors that are ungodly? And the last one, are we spreading a godly message or a politically slanted message? We have to ask ourselves those questions. Amen. And only you can answer those questions as it relates to you. And I usually don't get political because, again, I don't want to be identified with anything that's not like God. So when I told you about that type A personality, it's man-made. I don't want to be, I don't want to be affiliated with that. Political parties, and not, not to say I don't vote, because I do. It's important to vote, to have your voice heard. So I definitely do vote. But I don't want to be so bogged down with the political party that I lose sight of what's happening between he and I. Because that's what's the most important, the relationship between he and I. And I even tell Larry sometimes, turn the TV off. It's too much. Turn it off. Because it, we can just get that bogged down with the, the news. Because some of us are watching the wrong channels, listening to the wrong stuff. And I want to make sure that my heart is right with him. Amen? Amen. And I see some of your faces, and it's okay. When it's, when it's right, it might be tight sometimes. But it's okay. It has to be said because we are too divided as a nation. We are way too divided as a nation. And we can't win souls over with the divisiveness that we have. We got to be able to come together. We got to be able to make sure we're connected one to another. And that connection is him. Not everything else that separates and divides us. Amen? Amen. Amen. So again, whose side are you on? God bless you.